so welcome to Clay Arts Centre. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Regina Farrell Fagan. I'm the Exhibitions Manager at Clay Arts Centre. Uh, Clay Arts Centre, if you are not familiar with us, uh, we are located in Portchester, New York. We are about uh, a little over 20 miles north of New York City. We are a non-profit uh, organization for the ceramic arts. Um, we uh, offer uh, education facility. Uh, we teach people of all ages um, ceramics. Um, we have studio rental for all levels. We have artists and residence programs, a gallery, a shop, and we have a robust community arts program. Tonight's event is going to be moderated by Arlene Cox, so let me just tell you a little bit about Arlene. Um, Arlene is our moderator tonight. She's a Clay Arts Centre artist member and a board member at Clay Arts Centre. She recently gave a wonderful presentation with us as an emerging artist, which you can find in our virtual uh, library. Um, you'll get links after the event for all of these things that I'm mentioning tonight. Uh, she began sculpting after retiring from a 25-year career as a lawyer and corporate executive. For Arlene, art is more than just a medium for personal expression. It is also a tool in her arsenal to combat the possibility of Alzheimer's disease. In addition to exhibiting in numerous Clay Art Center exhibitions, she has also exhibited at the Harlem Fine Art Show in New York and Washington, D.C. She has also exhibited at the Art Center in Norfolk, Virginia, and Upstream Gallery in New York. She's a Clay Art Center uh, member of our board of directors, as I said, and she's also a member of Clay Art Center's anti-racist group. Uh, she collaborated with us tonight to develop and, tonight, and implement tonight's panel. So uh, Arlene, thank you so much for all your hard work for helping us uh, get this running tonight and I'm just going to share some of Arlene's work that she recently shared with us in her uh, presentation and Arlene you're welcome to take it from here. Good evening, uh, thank you Regina and thank all of you in the audi audience for joining us for tonight's panel discussion. Uh, I'll be acting as the moderator but this show belongs to the sustained panel of artists. It's been a remarkable, even tragic year, and not just because of COVID. Uh, recent events in America have sharply highlighted the ongoing struggle for so social justice and racial equality for African Americans in the face of police brutality and systemic racism. This racism and racial inequality has been laid bare, not just for everyone in this country to see, but for the whole world to see. Throughout history, art has been used as a tool for communicating and raising awareness about social issues, issues and using it to affect positive change. At the Clay Art Center, we've been trying to determine what we can do to help address this racism and racial inequality and how we can provide support for the Black Lives Matter movement. The Clay Arts Center is pleased to do its part. So we are so pleased to have convened this panel of incredibly talented African-American artists to provide us their insights on the very important topic, the role of art in the fight for social justice. So let me just tell you the format for tonight's panel and then I will introduce the panel. So I'm going to introduce the panel and once I'm going to do their individual um, introductions, you will see some uh, pieces of their work. But after I finish introducing them, I've asked each of the panelists to tell us and give us a single statement that is a non-biographical fact about themselves. And it can be about them or their art and I'm really challenging them because I'm asking them to do it in one sentence. So let's see how they do it doing that. Uh, and then we're gonna dive right into uh, our discussion for tonight. And as uh, Regina indicated, we're going to uh, reserve some time for questions and answers. And 
Um, I hope you really enjoy the discussion. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Our first panelist is Paul Briggs. Uh, Paul is originally from New York and is presently an associate professor of art education at the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston, Massachusetts. And he's also director of the historic Saturday Studios program. Paul has been teaching art since the age of 19 and has taught at, at K through 12 public and independent school levels, as well as the university level. His art is widely exhibited, exhibited across the US and recent shows include Cell Persona, Incarceration's Impact on Black Lives, which was held at the Northfield Arts Guild in Northfield, Minnesota, and Empowering Voices at the Lucy Lacoste Gallery in Concord, Massachusetts. Paul, in describing his work, states that slab building is his primary method of expression, and that allows him to think through ideas and contemplate them con concretely, while pinch forming is what he does to meditate. Uh, thank you, Paul, for joining us tonight, and could you share your single non-biographical fact about yourself? Thank you, Erlene. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you, Clay Arts, for, uh, for, for hosting this, this panel. Let's see, my one biographical fact, I think I'm going to have to say that I was a pastor for 10 years. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Shall I elaborate? Nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because he was my pastor and um, my daughter asked me, was I going to make that point? I said, well, if he wants to make it, he can make it, but I'm not making it. So uh, our next panelist is Vinnie Bagwell. Vinnie is also a New York native and a renowned artist who displayed immense art talent at a very early age. Uh, Vinnie is an untutored artist and began sculpting in 1993. Her first public artwork, the first lady of jazz, Ella Fitzgerald, at the Yonkers Metro North Amtrak train station was commissioned by the city of Yonkers in 1996. Her achievements include being awarded numerous public work commissions in New York and across the United States. One of her most recent accomplishments is the conception and development of the Enslaved Africans Rain Garden in Yonkers, New York. This is an urban heritage public art project for the city of Yonkers. Uh, and it was done to mark the 400th anniversary of enslaved Africans being brought to America. And it commemorates the first enslaved Africans freed by law in the United States 64 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. In addition to being an artist, Vinnie is also a writer, and she's the co-author of the book, A Study of African American Life in Yonkers from the Turn of the Century, which was published in 1992. Vinnie is an agent for social, educational, and economic growth through the arts in her community. Thank you, Vinny, for joining us tonight. Could you share your one non-biographical fact about yourself? Un unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> um, my one fact would be um, I'm a foodie. I love, I love really good food. And as of late, I'm loving Dungeness crabs. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Vinny. Our third panelist is Wesley Brown. Uh, Wesley was first introduced to ceramics in high school. He studied at Bowling Green State University, where he got the opportunity to work and travel. This gave him the opportunity to work with ceramics in such faraway places as China and such near places as Seagrove, North Carolina. 
His travels helped him define and develop his undergrad thesis, which was a body of work on African-American identity. While completing his Masters of Fine Art, West developed, a body, West developed a body of work addressing his struggles with major depressive disorder. He completed a residency at Baltimore Clay Works. His work today seeks to embody struggle, trial, triumph, and memorial. Thank you, Wesley, for joining us tonight. And could you share your one non-biographical fact about yourself? Um, I would say my, and to put it into one sentence, which is really hard, right? would be, um, my earliest and formative years were spent entirely in places that were predominantly white. And I won't, I won't, and we'll get to the rest That's of that right. later. Stop saying, right? <laughs> okay. One sentence. Right. Okay. Uh, let's get started. Okay, so uh, I wanted to do a fire starter question. So the first question uh, I'd like for you guys to address is how with all the events that have been going on and everything is front and center and on video, um, how have these recent events impacted you and your work as an artist? Hmm. Uh, why don't you lead off? Wesley. I, I can start with that one. Uh, I would say I'm not, I don't know how it's affected my work. It hasn't yet. Um, but I can say that it's definitely affected me as a person. <laughs> um, I think the, the best way I can say it is just to tell the story of it. I, I think I, George Floyd was big for me. Like it, I remember I found out about him and the whole situation and what had happened. I think I watched maybe 30 seconds of the video and was just like, couldn't watch anymore. And for about three or so days, I was fine. Uh, was functioning, was going to and from work, um, was fulfilling all of my responsibilities and something about one night I was thinking about it and I went to bed and I woke up the next day and I was still thinking about it. I think I drove my wife to work, came back home and was floored. Um, something about it just hit and I think I cried for about two hours straight and then for the next like three days I was just in grieving is the only way that I could put it was just I felt this immense loss um, which didn't make sense and that was the thing that I kept saying is like how do I feel such a loss for someone I've never met and so it's something that's affected me deeply, um, but only, but for a time. And now it's like, okay, I'm, I gotta get back to it. And I don't know how it's going to affect my work. Um, I don't know if my work will take steps to communicate what I just said mm -hmm. um, and I'm still feeling but I can say that um, it's been, it's been, to put it lightly, it has been traumatizing. Okay. Getting word of all this stuff, all these injustices happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. what, what about you, Vinny? Hmm, where do you begin with that? Um, I think the first thing is that, um, well, let's talk about pandemic first. <clears throat> pandemic was interesting because my governor uh, office called me on day two and asked me was I willing to work and I was like oh yeah and then the question is are your people willing to work it's like yeah we all want to work so on day two of self-quarantine um, I was designated as a central business which was very helpful because I was in the middle of several commissions um, although I had finished my part you know, in sculpting, um, my foundries were all shut down. So by enabling me to be in a central business, anybody who worked under me was then able to work. So my foundries were ecstatic because everybody could open up. And then of course the big challenge was trying to figure out how to open up because for instance, um, you know, and again, we're in New York, 
some of the workers were in New Jersey. And the question is how to get to work if you don't take the subway or, you know, so we had all these complications that we had to figure out how to navigate. Um, luckily for me, I was working for, again, New York State, so they were very accommodating in trying to help us not lose momentum. And so that was a tremendous experience, um, you know, working with a state government um, who had a can-do, let's get this done kind of attitude. And I have to say, I really, really appreciate it because my life was uninterrupted by pandemic. Um, you know, I work at home anyway, so that, that wasn't a, a real concern. Um, so, so Journal Truth was able to be installed on time. The Enslaved Africans Rain Garden Project, again, um, the challenge with that is that that founder was in Florida, so I had to keep going with the self-quarantine, but still um, was able to get there and work. Um, regarding, let's just start with Brianna Taylor, actually. Um, I was amazed, uh, I found out about her in the middle of the night on social media. Um, not uh, through people, but through an article, because you know how you can go on Facebook and you can read articles. So I like to read stuff. And, and then I went back to Facebook looking to see who was talking about it and nobody said boo. So I'm thinking the next morning, I'm gonna wake up and there's gonna be a barrage of things. And for several days, nobody is talking about this woman. I said, oh, oh, so we're all so deeply into pandemic. We don't even, we're not even gonna, we're not even gonna talk about this, really? Oh, oh, oh okay. So, I don't know, you know, less than a month later, here comes George Floyd. And now people are like really bent. And, you know, by this time, you know, we're going into May and New York is coming out of pandemic. And, you know, we're all just trying to slowly figure out how to get back to some version of normalcy. And so um, I had to see my daughter in four months, which is a long time for us because I, I see her all the time. And we decided to congregate at my parents' house. So, you know, we social distance and we had a cookout outside the whole night. And so we're getting ready to leave and the TV is catching my eye and I'm like, wait, what was going on? Because I kept seeing different videos of things on fire. And then it dawned on me, I'm like, wait, New York? Oh, the revolution has begun? It's like, I gotta go home. So if I went home and for the rest of the night, I'm watching CNN, MSNBC, something, and they're showing me how the world is catching fires, like little fires everywhere. And so um, I was like, oh, this is so deep. And of course, it's unfortunate that things like that have to happen as a catalyst, but so much has happened for, let's just talk about Black people. So much has happened for us that, um, this is timely, you know, it, it's like there's something called the wall, the last straw, and we're there. And frankly, um, it has done a remarkable thing for public art. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, Paul? Uh, I think, didn't Gil Scott Heron say that the revolution will not be televised? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think whether you're talking about the uprising, the pandemic, the political crisis, that I can't imagine that anyone to some degree hasn't been disturbed. So I, I think it's a matter of degree and not kind. So yeah. when Wes was talking about how he was impacted, maybe the work didn't change, but surely for me, the work was impacted. I didn't necessarily change what I was doing. I was already doing a particular type of work in response to uh, an injustice in our society. Um, but I sure needed to pinch more. What has changed is the attention that the work has been getting. And it's hard to know how to feel about that. I was like, I was doing, I've been doing this work, for, this particular work for uh, uh, three or four years. Y'all didn't know this then? <laughs> 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 <But> now, <laughs> 
you know, so I, I've been using the terminology that uh, my practice has been disturbed. Mm. And at different times, the degree to which I feel that disturbance or that enters the work is, is different. And I don't think anyone with some sense of, 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 of connection to the world uh, some sense of compassion can escape that. Hopefully not for long. <laughs> so that's, that's probably where I am. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, clearly, I think uh, everyone recognizes this is like an inflection point uh, in this country. And um, it's coming through in um, people wanting to understand and know better and, and fully get a better picture of what this social injustice and this equality is about. And it's a great opportunity for artists, uh, Black artists, to, to be a part of that. So my next question is, um, what do you think is the relationship between art and social justice and social change. And Vinny, why don't you lead us off on, on that one? Well, if you're talking about art in general, that's one thing. If you're talking about public art, that's a whole other talk show. So since I do public art, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, artists in general are like the stewards of this nation's memory. And, you know, they'll say to you that Lover writes, the history is the one who controls the memory. And so on many levels, it's our responsibility as African Americans, as black artists to make sure that we get to have our authentic voice represented. And so um, that's pretty much what I've committed to, to make sure that uh, when there's an opportunity, I get to give the kind of care that I think that our history deserves to make sure that we're well represented. Thank you. Uh, Paul? I've been saying that this, this period will be called the, you know, when the art historians look back, they're going to call this the, uh, the period of social justice. <laughs> You know that there's this big, there's this this big emphasis of the of artists on on uh, what's going on in the world. This response to that, and so the my particular uh, take on it is that. Art is always part of the change in society, but it's not always pushing for social justice. Mm -hmm. As Vinny was saying, when certain art gets shown, that art is telling the story. And art that might create social change often was not shown. And so it didn't get to push society in that direction. So art is always pushing society in a direction but it wasn't always pushing in a social justice direction because that, that work wasn't embraced. Now that a lot of that work is, the, the topic is hot, <laughs> we're seeing more <laughs> attention given to that work. And this is a good thing because every, every aspect of society, every, I mean, I'm so, the Democratic uh, Cup project is, is, is no more, but to see social justice on the side of a cup, it's a good thing because remember on the side of soap, on the side of cereal boxes, on the side of syrup in movies, we got here because every aspect of society, visually, visual culture contributed to where we are. And so every aspect of society also, and this is not to put pressure on anyone to change their practice, Although I am challenging my students right now to, <laughs> to embrace some sort of uh, so, social justice response, even 
even if just in the sketchbook, you don't make you don't maybe have to move beyond the sketchbook, but know what it's like to have your your practice disturbed. So I I, I think uh, art is is always there. And as someone has said, no great movement gets off the ground without the arts being there. Whether you're talking about snick singers or milk singers, you know th that is a type of performance art. And so I think I better reel it in right there. <laughs> Um, uh, any, any comments, uh, Wes, that you want to make? Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to what is the relationship between the arts and social justice is, I, I very much agree with Vinny when she talks about being able to be seen publicly and present your own narrative. The arts has that opportunity for people to tell their story and for that to be seen, um, whether that's through dramatization or poetry or m music or like we do, the visual arts, it, it gives an opportunity for people to be seen. And I think one of the things that I've been impressing upon my students is an ability to humanize the artist through looking at the art, um, understanding that you're, you're looking at an object but that it has these layers through which it's speaking, that, that no medium is without a history. It's without its own baggage. And so knowing when you're looking at a piece, it's, it, if it's good, it, it grabs you first. The words of the poem grab you, the, the lyrics grab you, the visuals grab you, and then it can pull you in and, and show you somebody's story or a narrative that's different from what you know. So arts is an ability to either work with the status quo or to bring out of what we know to be a lot of statistics and numbers a story that you can relate to. Um. What, um, what, what um, are, do you think is the most important topics uh, that art should be addressing I, uh, outside of the broad social justice? I'm learning hate. Mm. Okay. I think that's the big thing uh, that this country has to really work on is unlearning hate. Hate is a learned behavior. Mm. Uh, have probably mostly learned it at home. And I think uh, also to, when we're learning this also to through the process of our, um, our political uh, climate as well in terms of you know, the, the, the government, what's going on with the presidency and all that. We really have to spend some time trying to figure out methods to teach civility and to unlearn hate. That's, that's a good point. Uh, Paul? Yeah, well said, well said, uh, Vinny. Uh, Dr. King said, uh, with you know with that little quip in his voice, <laughs> you know, the the law can't make a person love me, uh, but it can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty good. <laughs> so embedded in that statement is an understanding that laws can't change the heart. And so, yeah, absolutely, we got this long way to go, right? To, uh, first of all, to keep, keep laws serving everyone, but also, yeah, to work on that, to work on our hearts, yeah. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, another topic. Um, how can artists address this issue within their own institutions. Um, you know, we're kind of facing that in the Clay Art Center of, you know, what, so we want to do something, but what can we do? So, uh, Paul, why don't you lead off on that one? Okay. Let me, let me preface it by talking a little bit about Ibram Kendi's work. Ibram Kendi, you know, he was just came to Boston University to uh, the Center for Anti-Racist Research. And so he, he breaks the discussion up into a racist idea and an anti-racist idea. And most of our institutions were founded upon racist ideas, right? Whether it was a lunch counter, 
you know, a bus, a, a political movement, gerrymandering, whatever it happens to be, it's founded in a, in a racist idea. And so what we have to understand is that no system in this country has escaped it. Matter of fact, it is beyond the borders of the U.S. All of our institutions are infused with ways that kept people out. Now, we're focusing on race here, but we can go gender, we can go sexuality, we can go economics, we can go class, okay? But we're, we're going to, as, as I think uh, Reverend Barber said, we're going to put this fire out the house that's burning, <laughs> about to burn down. We're going to put that fire out first. <laughs> so we have to, first of all, understand that all of, all of these institutions, you know, have some sort of racist bias. All right, so women, we know that women make, right, still 80% on the dollar, you know, by and large for men. We, we know that's there. Why is that there? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sexist thing happening that keeps that in place. Well, we have, to, we have to also know that that's true for race, that there's something built into our society that is impacting every institution, even those institutions that think they're very progressive. When you begin to look at them, you realize that, whoa, we're, there's still a racist tendency there. And so we have to move to something that's anti-racist. So, so these institutions need to first come to grips with that and then understand that in order to change that, you have to do something, right? You have to hold the panel. You, you have to make it possible for difference to be there. And also you need to prepare yourselves because if you're just going for diversity, you're gonna bring a bunch of people in and inclusion will not happen. So you have to prepare yourself first in order to have difference there and to respond to it correctly and then we can begin to move forward. But you're not going to think through your programming correctly. Every, everything's going to be rooted in this, and again, in a racist idea. And Ibram Kendi says when he was young, when he was speaking, often he would be speaking um, based on racist ideas. Now, not he's a racist, but he's, he's functioning out of racist ideas. So I know as trying to be a feminist that I'm Austin, right? Um, just misogyny is in every commercial that I see on TV, it's everywhere. That I always have to be doing that internal work to know that I have a particular gaze, a particular way of thinking and moving in the world that oppresses women. And I have to consciously work to undo that. Thank you. Uh, Wes? Ooh. That, that was a that was a lot to take in. <laughs> that was a good bit. That was a good bit. Um, yeah, I'd say like to address uh, the issues within our own institutions. I looking at ceramics. Um, I think the easiest way, if you want to get a good idea of what the ceramics field look like, is attend to Nseka. The National, the National Council for Education in the Ceramic Arts. You go to the big conference, it's in March, and you look out across the cornucopia of people, and you notice on one side of the scale of colors, there are significantly fewer. For me, it's, um, I like what Paul is saying when he's talking about needing to address it. I think one of the things is understanding with the idea of starting with something that's based in racism or anti-racist is you can own when you set up that system you close people out for so long that eventually hey maybe they don't show up. I mean you can only slam the door in someone's face so many times before they say hey I'm not a, I'm gonna not wait by this door. I'm gonna go to the street. So understanding that ceramics has been this thing that's kept people out <laughs> for a long time, especially even along economics, um, which we know race plays into, that you have to be proactive on making intentional decisions to do that. That's one of the things that I loved being a part of when I was at Baltimore Clayworks was the community arts was taking ceramics into the inner city to those places where people wouldn't have access to it. I mean, the way that it can be addressed universally is 
opening up those doors and those institutions making an effort to overcome the disparities or the roadblocks that were put in place to keep people out. So it's not just enough to open the door. You then have to build the bridge because you understand those people have, they were on that side and they, just because you open the door doesn't mean they want to walk right in. You, you need to help them <laughs> because so many of those things, it, they weren't just closing a door. It was also destroying the road for them, for people to get access. So that's what I would say universally is there has to be this outreach of those institutions to get those other narratives, those other stories, the prominence and the same, <laughs> the same amount of respect um, before all the people. So that, that's what I'll say. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I, those are, I want to broaden the question and then maybe Vinny, since you do um, public works, this is, this is a good question for you to take. Um, it's one thing to get more artists in, but how do we broaden the artists, the audience that has access to the art so that we can bring about the change that, that, that you're talking about? It's a twofold question. I want to address the first part and then I'll come back. Okay. I think part of the equation is privilege. Um, privilege is so subtle that people who have it don't really even realize it because they take it for granted. Um, those people who don't have it know they don't have it. Um, sometimes we don't even realize to what degree we've been marginalized. And so um, what Wesley is just finished saying was very metaphoric for the public art arena because it is a white patriarch oriented arena. It's been this way for thousands of years. Um, it is set up a certain kind of way. Um, you know, the media is calling me and asking me, you know, how can we get more women and minorities in the public art realm? And I'm like, it's not going to happen fast and it's not going to happen easy because of the way that that arena, that institution, if you will, is set up. And so um, in the final analysis, you know, you, you've got several things to consider. Number one, you've got of course, you've got, I mean, the world is littered with geniuses, littered with really, really amazingly talented people. Um, the real question is, how do you break through the ceiling? There's like an invisible ceiling that you have to break through or an invisible wall that you have to break through. And you don't just break through it with tenacity. You have to, in this arena, you have to be invited. Somebody has to help you because it's set up by privileged people to keep certain other people out. And how they do it is through the economics. Example, in order to get a public art project, you have to have one. It's the chicken and the egg. If you don't have one, how are you gonna get one if you can't, if you understand? And then the second part of it is, is that, you know, the question is who gives you the first break? How does that happen? You know, now in my experience, I know that it can happen. That's how I got in. But how I got in was very unusual. And for people now who are becoming aware that the public art arena exists and that it's an opportunity um, to develop a career and that there's all these things that, that can happen for your life in that arena, the question is, how do you get in the arena? And it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's daunting because somebody has to extend themselves and help you. It just doesn't happen by chance. Uh, thank you guys very, very much. Um, I'm going to pivot to another question. Uh, and this question is, uh, what advice would you give uh, young African-American artists? Um, as artists who have achieved a level of success, you know, what do you tell young artists about how they can get what you have and how, how they can succeed? You, you, first of all, you need to really, really love what you do. You, you have to have a passion for it. You have to feel like it's like the air that you breathe. Mm -hmm. it. 
Um, my parents are artists, both of them. I never thought of them as artists because they didn't need to make art. They made art every blue, pink moon when they felt like it and it was good. Mm. <clears throat> so I didn't think of them. I mean, I was 40 before I realized that my parents were artists because I'm so used to them. You know, everybody in my family is creative. But the point of it is that you need to love your work. You need to care about it so much that you educate yourself, that you challenge yourself. Um, if you're going to try to make it as a working artist, someone who wants to make money, earn a living with it, then, you know, you're going to really need to understand business uh, from the standpoint of how to market your work, how to present your work. Um, you need to learn how to write. If you don't know how to write, you need to go learn someplace how to write because if you're competing, you're going to have to be able to articulate with real words, convince somebody to say yes to you. Um, it's, it's, it's not enough just to want to make art. You know, you have to want to be successful as a business. It's a business. And so um, mentors are good. You know, again, we have the internet, self-tasking, you know, all the answers are on the internet. You can find out. But what you really need is to find somebody who's already in the arena to ask the hard questions so that maybe you can learn something because for public art, again, you can't go to school for it. You have to know somebody who's doing it and ask them, the question is like, this is where I am. How do I get from point A to point J? How does that happen? And it's a process. And so um, I think, again, it begins with your desire. How bad do you want it? Because if you don't want it real bad, there's somebody who does. Uh, um, thank you, Vinny. Paul, uh, saw you laughing back there. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just... Vinny maybe should have bet, bet clean up on this question because <laughs> Agreed. I, I think she got all the uh, points there. Right? I just, but I'll, I'll approach it from this angle okay. and uh, love what you do. I, I, I was thinking, uh, chase your own muse. Like some, I see, I, I see a lot of young artists right now starting to chase somebody else's muse because it seems to have worked but you have to chase your own muse it's got to be your own in, it's, it's got to be your own inspiration and you definitely have to stay at it i had a few mentors i had mentioned that i that i i, I was a pastor for 10 years a great congregation and I remember when I first got in there, I, 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 I was like, I'm not going to do any art right now. I'm doing this. I'm pastor. And there were, there were a couple of families in the church. I'm not going to mention the, the Cox family. Right. <laughs> <I think. laughs> and and then when the, there was another family that was even more outspoken to them who said to me, well, that's stupid. <laughs> it's a gift. <laughs> So, you know, so I, I started working and then one of my mentors used to always say to me, are you working? Are you working? So even be, even when, you know, I, I, I felt like my particular call at that time was coming to a close, I was already exhibiting, you know, and I fact, I used to, people used to scratch their heads. They said, you a pastor? I said, yeah. And then, man, we got to go to this church and see what kind of <laughs> artist is a pastor. And then the, the church people would say, what, you, you got a little hobby? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to stay, you got to chase your own muse and stay very serious about it. Keep working, keep working, right? Chase the muse. Inspiration will come, but it has to find you working. And then also surround yourself with a community of people that you trust get connected because as Vinny was saying, you got to get connected so that, and that's why you have to keep working. Cause when the opportunity comes, you better be ready to put up the goods. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I, I guess, I guess finally I would say, keep your eyes on the right prize. Even after that, even after you gain a little success, just keep your eyes on the prize of, what was it that, what, what was the muse that you were chasing? What were you trying to say? Who were you trying to reach? What was the work about? And just stay at that, you know, because, uh, you know, the wave may come, you may ride it for a little while, but if you don't stay to your muse, then you won't be ongoingly productive. So, all right, thank you. 
uh, going to to um, listen to Paul's sermons on Sunday, you could always count on uh, the church brochure having a piece of art on it with a uh, spiritual message, message attached to it. It was a lot of fun for me as an artist. Uh, Wes, do you um, have a, a, a practical point you want to share with everyone? Oh, I don't, I don't know how practical it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I completely agree with Vinny when she says you have to want this. Um, there are a lot easier things to do than to be self-employed. A lot, a lot of other things that you could do, you have to want this. Um, and I completely agree with Paul when he says you've got to follow your muse. I distinctly remember, I remember when I was an undergrad and Eva Kwong came and she was doing uh, studio visits. And I remember I was making work and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And she looked at me and she just said, if you can't, no one else will. Wow. Because only you can tell your story. Wow. Um, you have to want this. It's not going to be easy. No one's going to hand it to you. Um, I had a friend. Uh, tell me and I'll so I'm quoting him as quoting someone else um, he went to a he went to a, a Christian university and he was told by his professor um, if they call for you they're not going to go looking for you on the couch they'll be looking for you in the studio so be working and I think there's there's also the there's the the Christian saying of um God doesn't uh, doesn't call the prepared; He prepares the call. Mm, so you you've got to be working. You've got to be working. It it has your studio practice has to be something that you have to do. That you can't not do. You have to be compelled. Exactly. You know, I, I have to say that um, a number of years ago, I declared that artists is a race of people. And the defining characteristic of our race has nothing to do with the other races. So it doesn't matter what color you are, how old you are, what gender you are, what sexuality you are, what language you speak. The bottom line is, what are you doing? And then ultimately, the question is, if, if, if the gift comes from God or whatever you believe in, it's like, well, then what do you do with the gift? And the gift is not for you to keep. The gift is for you to share. And the question is, how do you help humanity with your gift? Mm. And so, you know, everybody does it a different way. Um, for me, I discovered the power of beauty. You know, that beauty is healing. And that people respond to things that are beautiful. Beautiful things cost more money, you know. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, I chose to, of course, do black people, but I also chose to use beauty because I found that beauty was an easy way to deal with hard subjects. Mm. And so the point of it is, is that, you know, again, you have to decide what matters to you and direct yourself at the things that you care about the most and, and don't listen to the others because sometimes, you know, there'll be naysayers, crazy makers in your life that want to tell you what's wrong with what you're doing. And the ultimate question is, what do you believe? You know, what do you think this whole life experience is about? Why do you think you're gifted? What do you, what do you think the purpose of that is for? So you have to do a lot of, of introspective work. Go to therapy, help. You know, read some books, learn some things. Um, you know, there are two books I recommend to everybody. You need to read The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, and you need to read The Intuitive Way by Penny Pierce, because artists are highly intuitive. There's a lot of information that comes through you that you might be ignoring because you're not listening because you don't believe the information because it's not the kind of information that you're expecting that you want so you have to learn how to listen and then you got to do what you got to do guys this has been absolutely incredible i hope the audience has enjoyed uh this discussion as much as i have enjoyed it um uh i have about two minutes left uh, before we go to the question and answer. So I'm going to kind of open the mic, but you got two minutes, okay, to say, is there anything else uh, any of you want to say that you feel needs to be addressed? 
Well, you know, I've been toying with this this idea. It's not I haven't I haven't started it. You know, the I'm hearing it everywhere. the 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 Western mantra is, "I'm I'm spiritual, not religious." And so there's this idea of a a secular spirituality. And all the writers that I'm reading, whether you re you're talking about Mihai Chick sent me high, Harvey Cox, the Dalai Lama, Deborah Kaufman, there's just a list that goes on and on that are talking about the role that arts will play in this 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 in this kind of secular spirituality that's happening in our society. It doesn't take away anybody else's tradition. And in fact, the, there's this cross pollination that happens and the, the role that the arts will play in that and the ability of the arts to create flow. And out of the flow experience, this, again, this is a very secular psychologist guy, out of the flow experience comes a particular type of compassion and attention to detail. It, it's just, there's something that I, I've been saying, talking about chicken and egg, I've been saying, what came first? The, the, the egg of contemplative practice or the chicken of compassion? Was that two minutes for all of us or two minutes each? <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> no, no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> it was supposed to be two minutes kind of for all of you, but that's okay, Paul. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, what did they say? I re reserve back my time or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> back, uh, Wes or Vinny, because we want to get to the questions that, from the audience. Here. Let me look at um, I've spoken my piece. Okay, and Vinny? Oh, no, I'm looking for questions. Go ahead. Okay, all right. Guys, thank you so much. This has been absolutely extraordinary. Um, and so I'm going to turn it back over to Regina um for the for the questions that uh the audience would have been asking i ask the audience to please if you're directing your question to a particular artist specify it in what you write up um i don't think i come back but i just want to say to these uh three fine artists thank you thank you thank you so very much uh i've enjoyed working with the three of you getting to know you um, and good luck and much success. And um, thank you again. And so Regina, uh, oh, you. and I have a message for the audience, vote. <laughs> uh, okay, Regina, in your hands. Okay, thank you so much, Arlene. And thank you, uh, Wesley, Paul and Vinny. That was absolutely incredible and inspirational. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions and answers. If uh, anybody wants to, ask a question, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand feature next to your name. Uh, if you're not ready to ask something live, you can type it in to the uh, chat feature. I'm just looking here. Sean Clute, I'm gonna open up uh, your microphone. Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, um, thank you so much. Such a, a, a rich uh, conversation. I got so many little nuggets there, uh, I'm much appreciated. Um, so I am a, uh, a theatrical figurative sculptor uh, trying to address social and political issues. And uh, this question is for anyone uh, that wants to answer. Um, how does a, uh, a non uh, color, or, sorry, how do uh, non people of color positively uh, contribute to social issues uh, through their practice? Is there specific do's and don'ts uh, that you've seen in the art world. Thank you. I, I don't know where the raise hand button is. Can I answer that? Go for it. Um, I think that the most important thing is civic engagement. It's really important that you talk to your audience. If you're making art for a particular audience, like for instance, you're doing site specific public art, then it's going someplace specific. You need to talk to that community to try to relate. Um, because you have to remember with public art that the art expresses the values of that community. If you're a curatorial artist, that's a whole nother talk show because for curatorial art, you can make whatever you feel that you want to make based on your interpretation and then you just simply present it and let people give you feedback. So it really depends on what your, your trajectory is, where you're coming from and what you want your 
um, outcome to be. Thank you so much, Benny. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that or shall I move on? I, I, I like to weigh in on that. Okay. Um, so as a non-person of color, how, how to talk about these things, I think with absolute sincerity, talk mm -hmm. about them as you understand it, as you know it, as you're seeking to know more, educate yourself and use your work to say what you know. Um, whether that's some, uh, hopefully, you know, always moving towards enlightenment, always learning more. Um, start with what you know and work from there. Present you, just because the beam of talking about social justice as a race related issue and just because you're not a part of the group that has been kept out or pushed down or oppressed doesn't mean that you can't have a view on that. and doesn't mean that you can't have a story that relates to that. It might be as, as Vinny was talking earlier about understanding privilege and not understanding and then understanding it, you know, there are so many routes where you can still talk about it, but don't talk, don't, uh, I, I'm not gonna, there's a, Anybody who knows Dave the Slave, there's a book about him written by a white guy imagining himself as Dave. That's the wrong way to go. Don't go that way. <laughs> Don't imagine yourself as a person of color. Tell your story. Don't try and tell someone else's. So if it starts off with, hey, I was ignorant. I was wrong. I didn't understand. I still don't understand. I'm moving towards understanding. You sound like someone who's moving in a direction of wanting to understand, make work in that line, in that vein. Start there. Thank you so yeah. much, Wesley. Paul, did you want to respond? Well, I, just, I, I just think, I, I always go back to, uh, there's a book called uh, Images of blacks in western popular culture and in that book you know he traces the history of representation of blacks from everything you know as i was referencing and in that book he says but the group that has the most disparaging images throughout the world are women and so when i find myself saying okay this is an issue for me i have I have, well, initially, you know, I was very selfish. I have daughters, you know? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't like this world for my daughters. And so I had to find my voice. Uh, Adiche's book, um, Why We Should All Be Feminists, you know, a little pamphlet. Um, but I, I need to educate myself first before I start speaking to these points or especially making work about it so I, I don't want to create more problems for the sisters you know by by, by something i put out there so i definitely want to uh to educate myself first so amy Sherrill clearly knew what she was doing right she represented brianna you know for vanity fair yeah i definitely i think wes is right prepare yourself Malcolm X, my, my sincerity is my credential. Thank you so much, Paul. Arlene, did you want to make a comment? The uh, only comment I would make is that as a lot of these events have gone on, uh, one of the most frustrating things uh, that I get quite often is I didn't know, I wasn't aware, I didn't understand this was going on. And it's frustrating because uh, it's about educating yourself. It's about uh, coming from behind your privilege and you know, getting out there and reading some books and looking at some history. Mm -hmm. um, and it means that you have to be vulnerable to do it. 
because inevitably you're going to see some things that means that you have contributed somewhat to the problem also. So you got to face up to that. That's a part of getting educated. So that would be my comment. Thank you so much, Arlene. Um, I'm just going to ask if anybody else wants to use the raise hand feature to ask us a live question. And I'm going to read down here. Uh, I have a comment here from Danielle. As Wes mentioned, be yourself and take responsibility for speaking up and taking actions. I'm white and it's necessary to talk to each other and constantly be aware of the power dynamics, economic, ethnicity, gender constantly in play. Thank you for that comment, Danielle. Um, I'm just reading through here. I'm getting a question in the Q&A. Okay, let me see. Could Paul speak more about the slow practice? I often feel like there is such an emphasis on producing work that the making process is rushed. On a related front, it was interesting and relatable to hear that just because current events may not be visually incorporated into the work yet, that doesn't mean they aren't having an impact, won't become visually present later also that it takes time to process. So that's directed to you, Paul. Could you speak more about the slow practice? I'll be, I'll be brief, about two fourth quarter football minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Mihai Csikszentmihalyi wrote the book Flow. And in this book, he talks about how he was studying the arts when he first got the idea, he's a positive, positive psychologist. And flow is when you have a you have a cha you have a challenge and you have a skill. If the challenge is way out here, then you're frustrated. If the challenge is back here, then you are bored. The challenge has to just outpace your skill, which is why we're always pushing ourselves to do more and better and better and better. That's how the work gets better. When you are in that moment of flow, it's not a peak experience, it's not an aesthetic experience, it's a flow experience. I've been describing it like this. Uh, when you're a little kid and you're outside playing and you know, you know it's dinner time and you know you gotta go to the bathroom but you can't stop playing because <laughs> you are in flow. <laughs> I've been joking, my bathroom is like right there. <laughs> I find myself running from my studio to the bathroom because you're in flow. And so those flow moments, what, do you, what, what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi says, if you slow down and just enter into those moments, you begin to develop what he calls an autotelic personality, a directed self, or to work ex usia, out of oneself. And when you do that, when you work that way and you become that type of person, Again, it, it has all types of beneficial effects on the psyche, um, but also you won't find yourself being bored. You you can you can get through a moment. It doesn't even it, eventually. It, it, it won't even you won't even have to do the work anymore necessarily. You can just think about the work when you're in the grocery line, you know. So, and it, it'll just take you to that to that quiet place, and it's so needed right now. Um, yeah. So I would say to find that, if, if art isn't doing that for you, find something else. But it, it should be something that's taking you away. It could be reading, you know, it could be walking. Uh, he, he goes into all the areas. But by and large, artists, uh, again, he found it most among the arts, among people who were in art. At some point in my life, it became, I, I was embarrassed to say that it was like the only thing that was able to keep me present. And that was, a, that was a hard thing for me to come to grips with, that it was the work that was, that was keeping me present. So it definitely became uh, my only way of uh, finding myself present and, and, and meditating. That's because so. we're still in the future. We spend a lot of time in the future. A number of years ago, I read a book on intuition and it talked about people's mentality about time. Some people live in the past, a lot of people live in the future. Very few people are present. 
And so, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's really right. Art does make you, the making of art makes you be present. But a lot of times you have to live in the future in order to imagine what you need to do now. So, you know, I'm, I think of, of artists as being time travelers. We go back and forth between the past, the present, and the future in the process of conceiving and making art. Thank you so much, uh, guys. I have another question here addressed to the entire panel. Uh, do panelists feel that the result of the upcoming election will affect the art community one way or the other? Who would like to take that? Um, it'll result in some really weird political cartoons. I know that that's for certain. That's a guarantee, especially if one candidate wins. There'll be more. But for those of us in New York, um, we have been crushed by the federal government's um, lack of compassion. And um, there are a number, I mean, more than a half a dozen public artworks that were scheduled to be created about people of color that are all on hold in New York City, for example, um, because New York City is in recovery mode. And so uh, we're very prayerful that there will be a change in leadership and that there will be a reprioritizing um, of uh, federal funding so that the arts can continue to do what the arts is meant to do in New York. Yeah, that, they're, they're talking right now about that Philip Gustin show that was going to be spread out among a few museums. It got pulled because of some of the subject matter that was in, in uh, you know, the subject matter in his work. And I, I, I was just writing that, it, what, Vin, what Vinny was saying, T.S. Eliot said, uh, what the, you know, Trotsky was saying that, uh, you know, when everything is, you know, communist, uh, the art will be better. And, and T.S. Eliot's response was, no, no, the, it won't necessarily be better. It, it will just be a different type of subject matter for the artist. What the artist needs is freedom to create. So what we hope is that the arts will continue to be funded and that, the, that all types of work will continue to be shown and that we can come together and have dialogue around those bodies of work. So uh, I understand that there's a call for that Philip Gustin work, as controversial as it is, uh, to be shown so that we can talk about some of the issues because they're pertinent for the times in which we, in which we're, that we're living, in which we're living. Thank you so much, Paul. Does anybody else want to uh, address that question? So I'd, I'll follow up my silly comment in the beginning with, um, I think the arts are going to become more and more important. Um, as things become more and more political, there's, for me at least, there's this feeling of powerlessness and wanting to know that you're heard and a, a need for catharsis of some kind. And I feel like the arts give us the ability to do that, that artists who create things from their soul, that's a piece of them, are able to communicate those unspeakable emotions. And so it'll become more important for the arts as our time seems to get more polarized, seems to get more monumental in the catastrophes, uh, both social, economic, and environmental. As those grow, people are gonna wanna know who am, what the questions will always remain, who am I? Why am I here? And those are questions that every artist, whether they're consciously or are always going to be addressing that in some way. Yeah, I think they're gonna, the arts are gonna become, are only going to continue to be more important. And as times continue to become less and less stable, they're gonna become even more important. You know, this myth that the president has pulled the curtain back on is pretty clear and salient. 
And James Baldwin said, if we're going to understand those type of issues having to do with race and gender and sexuality, it's going to take the arts. Because the, the, the arts are going to hit us in a place where, like this whole discussion, you know, is as much as I've enjoyed it, you know, the, there's a there's a piece out there to prick this into our hearts, as our words can can never do. And yeah, so I, I agree with that, Wes. And I, I wouldn't knock those cartoons, brother. You know, <laughs> this, remember, you don't have the freedom to, remember there were a cartoonist who, uh, who, who drew some pieces and they, right, they, they, they had their lives threatened. Oh, this is what I yeah. mean about having the yeah. freedom to create, you know, art around and then have discussions around issues, you know, I mean, I'm not for censorship, but I think some, I, I, I Again, that internal work makes you able to censor yourself if needed, if necessary. I, I think the other thing that's really important to, um, to remind people is that, you know, you have to kind of figure out how to sit in your center. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's an internal centering um, that you have to work on so that when external things happen, they don't knock you off center. Um, and that requires a a, a tremendous amount of introspection, you know, as uh, Wesley said, who am I, where am I, what the heck is this, what am I doing here, what do I want to do, how am I spend my time, what matters, what's important, what am I trying to say, you know, who should I spend my time with, how am I wasting my time, how can I better use my time, you know, what am I doing with my money, you know, how am I investing my money, you know, it, it, it requires, again, a tremendous amount of introspection and focus on your own personal well-being because in order for you to make really great art, you have to have a certain measure of clarity. And for that, you kind of need peace. Thank you so much, Vinny. Um, I do see one hand raised here. I'm not sure if it's intentional. Carol, Carol Long, your hand is raised. Um, I'm going to open your microphone if you have a question. Do you have a question, Carol? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. I do see lots and lots of people uh, thanking you all for sharing your uh, inspiration tonight. Um, I see one more question here. Thank you all so much for this super insightful and nutritious session. It's been really interesting to see from outside the US. Oh, that's good. I'm glad we were able to uh, bring everybody together tonight. So I don't see any more questions, but I do want to thank the panelists. Oh, I do see one more question. Yeah, yeah there is one more. Yeah, uh, again from Alison, could you all give some examples of artists or artworks that you think are successful in engaging social justice issues. During the pandemic, there were times where the privilege of making art felt so irrelevant to the everyday needs of people. Oh, and essential workers. The last bit got cut off. Who would like to address that? Yeah, I don't think you have to go to, again, a lot of this work didn't just pop up. People were already doing this work, you know. Carol Walker was already doing her work. Roberto Luva was already doing his work, you know. I mean, the Democratic Cup project was already happening. Obviously, Vinny and Wesley, you know, and myself, we we're already doing the work. This work is getting more attention now. Uh, I would check out the Color Network on Instagram. There's a, a highlighting a lot of artists. I mean, I, I've been saying the Color Network. Uh, they've been <laughs> I'm like, man, I didn't know there were that many, that many black people out there in ceramics, you know, and especially like studio potters. I'm like, man, that, that many studio potters out there. So I think, I uh, yeah, I think I think there are artists out there already, uh, in, in 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 lots of different mediums, uh, who are who are already uh, who are already doing the work. But yeah, I think you can get introduced to a bunch from uh, from. Um, color network as well. Yeah. Mm, I would say one the one artist who like jumps to mind whose career I've loved is um, Kehinde Wiley, the painter. 
he was um, here in Dayton at the Dayton Art Institute um, downtown. Um, when I started going there as a kid, they had one of his paintings of a, of a black man standing. And it was the first painting you saw when you entered the rotunda. And I didn't understand at the time just how big a deal that was. So to the question of um, artists that I think are engaging it, I think he's doing a, a fantastic job. His work, it's big and it's bold and it's, it's speaking using the visual vocabulary of a particular type and style of painting that is not for black use. And he's stepping into that and he's claiming it. So he's, he's claiming something for black people. And in doing so, it makes you question, what is my frame on this? And he's been doing that forever. I mean, a, a good long time. I mean, he's, he's like one of the first that comes to my mind. And um, you said during the pandemic, there were times where the privilege of art making felt so irrelevant to the everyday needs of people and essential workers. I would say, yes. <laughs> um, there was definitely some time when I did not have a studio. I've been in between studios for the last year or so since I started teaching uh, here in Dayton. And yeah, there is, there's definitely with uh, gig work, I ended up having, I do gig work. So like when it's up, it's up. And when it's down, it's down. So like, there is like, hey, if I'm gonna have a studio, I gotta have another job to pay for my studio time. But for me, it's, it's not so much a privilege as it's something I work towards having. Um, and I think my, my wife will attest that when I do not have my studio time, I'm not, I'm not firing off on all cylinders. Um, so I would say, yeah, when it comes to the everyday needs, having a studio, for me personally is something that I, even when I didn't have a studio, I, I was out on my patio, like doing metalworking, just cause I had, I had to do something with my hands. So for me, being creative is not a privilege. It's a necessity. Again, it, a lot of it has to do with your perspective about your gift. Um, I, I, I love Jordan Peele right now. I wasn't really a fan <laughs> lately with Redcraft Country. Um, what I'm appreciating about um, that series is that he is putting people of color in movie genres that we were not seeing in before. Like for instance, When's the last time you've seen a black Indiana Jones? You know, um, very few filmmakers approach suspense. You know, Alfred Hitchcock is the master. I mean, I grew up watching him like every week. And uh, when I really began to think about it, I realized not many people attempt that genre and he does and he does it well. And he's using people of color in the process, which is on some levels amusing because Lovecraft was a racist and I'm sure he's rolling over watching Jordan Peele interpret his art using people of color. It's kind of like serendipity and balance. You know, the, the pendulum swings both ways. Um, I think the other thing to, uh, to remember is that not all artists are having the same um, experience. So there are some folks who are uh, very uncomfortable and disturbed and distressed, and there are other folks that are perfectly fine and making art. And so I think, again, it has to do with how you manage yourself and how you feel about the experience you're having and how you want to express yourself or use your voice um, in the process of sharing with the rest of the world um, what you think and how you feel. Because a lot of times, things that you voice, you're voicing it for somebody else who doesn't have a medium. You know, that's the wild thing about well, being an artist versus not being an artist. A lot of people have ideas, but they don't have a way to express them. And so this is why sometimes when people see art that speaks to them, um, it's so um, compelling and, and impactful because you speak for somebody else. You're not the only person feeling like you're feeling, you know, and it's important to remember that. So 
you know, as we were saying earlier, you know, take whatever resonates with you the most and see how you can express yourself with that. And, and, and also work on your fear management, you know, stop scaring yourself. Um, really, you know, a lot of, of what is bothering you is in your head. It's not really happening. It's what you're thinking. You're going too far into the future. You don't have enough information. You don't have enough understanding or knowledge. And so you make yourself anxious, you know? So again, I think uh, a lot of the creative experience has to do with how you feel about yourself, how you feel about yourself relative to everybody else. And then also how you want to express uh, your feelings. Thank you so much, Vinny. Um, sorry, Paul, did you want to say something? No, I, I just, I just, I, I'm just enjoying how uh, these artists are pulling from everywhere. <laughs> you know, that their, their minds are expanded by, you know, this is the thing, what we see, what we come on, all, it's all subject matter that, that can feed you. So I'm just enjoying that. So I, I would just recommend that also to, you know, look beyond the field for, for examples and role models that your legacy of artists can't just be ceramicists. Yeah, so. I think the other thing that's uh, important to note is that uh, many artists are multi-talented. Like a lot of people have a multiple of mediums, like for instance, I draw, I paint, I write, I sculpt, you know, um, you know, if you find that one medium is not working, try something else. This is how I came to be sculpting. I had a painting block. I'm a really good painter, but I had a block for seven years. And um, it occurred to me that maybe I should figure out some way to prime my well. And I decided to try sculpting and the rest is history. So you know, if you find that you are daunted in some way and that you really can't get a grip on what you've been doing, then you might try something else. And you might find that there's something else that you really excel at, which is uh, sometimes stunning. You know, um, I have a cousin who was a spoken word artist and then she discovered that she's a really good painter. You know, so um, I think again, it has to do with having an open mind and being willing to step out and try things. Give yourself a chance. Yeah, I'm seeing some things in the chat. Uh, yeah, the it's one that, there from Danielle. Is that the one you were going to mention? Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's gone off uh, the chat. Let me see. Okay, from Danielle. Um, and I think I'm going to make this the last question because I know people are uh, moving to their TVs for tonight's debate. Um, mm -hmm. As I'm on this Zoom, there has been exchanges of gunfire in my neighborhood. And I'm wondering if any of you haven't felt or aren't safe, have you still been able to focus? I can, I can tell you that my students right now, I can just see it in their faces when we're in that Zoom classroom. Their, their practice is disturbed. They don't know, they do not know where their, because of everything that's going on in the world, they do not know where their muse is or what their muse is. They're having trouble practicing, even getting work made. I, I, I think the work, again, you have to have that inner life, that inner fortitude. Um, but again, one of my professors used to say, you know, chase the muse. If nothing else, he didn't say chase the muse. I, I got to keep that for myself, but. <laughs> He would say, at least just go to your studio and sit there and be with your work. Something, you know, go, go and just be there and, and sit. I don't know. I, I have, I've not, well, I have experienced what you've experienced before. Um, and yeah, I, I would, I would say, yeah. I, I, I used to say, I may not have gone through what you are going through but I believe the strength to go through it is possible. And in this context, as we talk about art, I think art can play a major role uh, in helping you through that. I think the other thing is, again, it comes down to what you really believe. Um, you know, having, having lived through the pandemic in New York where people were dying every 12 minutes, 
you know, uh, there was a period where we were all really scared to leave our houses because it was just stunning, uh, the reality. You know, but in the final analysis, the question is, you know, what do you believe about your life? And, you know, again, it comes back around to purpose and how you want to spend your time. If you wake up in the morning, you got time. The question is, what do you want to do with it? What's the most important thing to do? And, and trying to find balance. Yeah, making a living is important. But if you're not making a living as an artist and making art is something that you have a passion for, then you have to reprioritize. You know, and again, you live in a neighborhood where it's dangerous. The question is, do you really think that that is going to affect you in your home? Now, if it's really, really, really bad, then you might want to reprioritize and figure out how to leave that neighborhood. But maybe today that's not practical. But mm -hmm. change your mind and say to yourself, I'm safe. And for the next hour, I'm going to sit down and write something. I'm going to sit down and play a song. I'm going to make a painting. I'm going to do a drawing. You know, again, it's about learning how to focus yourself. And as he said, you know, go into your inner self. And when you come out, the world is still the same, but you're still here. And you have to believe that you're going to be safe. You're going to be fine. If you believe you're part of the purpose and you're not random, you don't have anything to be afraid of. Uh, I, I agree with Vinny. And one of the things that, um, that I... One of the things that I say to uh, anyone that comes and kind of plays in dirt with me is that I promise them that if they come, they're there for an hour, they're there for two hours, that in that two hour time, you won't think about anything but the dirt. And so I find uh, personally uh, a lot of peace in just, um, you know, doing the art itself. And so I hope, I hope most people uh, get that piece. Thank you, Arlene. Um, there are a lot of messages here thanking you guys for <coughs> sharing so honestly tonight and for uh, making uh, this a wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, we have recorded it, we will be sharing it in our uh, virtual library. Um, you can check back with us. We will be sending out an email with lots of links following uh, this event. Um, from Clay Arts Centre, I'd like to thank the panel again. Thank you all for your time. Um, thank you for being here with us. Arlene, thank you so much for moderating tonight. And to everyone who attended and everyone who donated and helps to keep making these events possible, um, we thank you as well. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Take Good night. care. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.